So Mind Unveiled just released a really good video on old world 19th century photo manipulation. And it's good for many reasons. The, the first reason is it's very comprehensive. So it gives a really good overview of all the photo manipulation techniques that they could use. So, you know, he talks about the sort of ghosting phenomena where they trick people into thinking it was, you know, spirits there in the photograph to composite images and cropping and copying and pasting and removing people. We were going to be doing a response video to another video regarding uh, photo manipulation, and he's kind of done the job for us. So thank you, Mind Unveiled. And I agree. I think it was a really good video. There were cases where he used Wikipedia, but then there was also cases where he was using books, the historical journals, which is the same thing that we do. So as a whole, I found it a really good video. Where he lost me is where he jumped to the conclusion that all photographs are fake. Basically, all old world photos are fake. And it kind of felt like it was straight out of the playbook of Ancient Aliens, where on that show, they're teaching you about these really interesting sites and you're getting into it, and then they come at you with their narrative where it's, it was the ancient astronauts. And you're like, well, hold up now. Like, come on. Like, that was a really good presentation you were doing. The only other part that I would add in, the I believe it was Le Gray. The research he did on Le Gray, where he showed that the sensitizing dyes actually could pick up skies back in the mid 19th century. I thought that was great because that was stuff I was unaware of. It certainly doesn't debunk the sensitizing dyes that leads to the Vanilla Sky narrative, but it adds to the story and shows that they could do that. They don't really talk about other figures like Gustave Legray. There are entire websites and a Wikipedia page dedicated to Legray. I'm not sure who they are from the statement they don't talk about Legray. But having now become aware of his name, it's very easy to search the web and get information on him. The presentation emphasizes that Legre's techniques was an industry secret and kept secret, while ignoring Legre's shady business practices and unsatisfied investors, which led to the studio's closing. Even on Wikipedia, it states that Legre's process had major practical disadvantages that made it inconvenient for field use. Yeah, you're right. And that's what Mind Unveiled doesn't emphasize, is that the the wet colloidium process, just in general, had a major disadvantage. And that was because it had to be done before the plate dried. And it says here, this gave the photographer no more than about 10 to 15 minutes to complete everything. And when you look into the combination printing, which Legray is doing to get that sky, you have to use two or more negatives to make one good print. And it says here, combination printing required a lot of careful work to plan out the concept of what the final image was desired to look like. It was also a task of great skill and patience. When a photographer wished to create a combination print, issues of good exposures, scaling the subjects to match up, and consistent lighting were all essentials. And then it says, for instance, in the example of combining a foreground subject with adding clouds to a sky, it is important to make sure that the direction of the light falling on the clouds is the same as the light used on the main subject in the original foreground negative. So this is not something that's easy to do. This is art. Legray's innovative photographic techniques, he was trying to push the boundaries, but the technology was not really there to turn this into something that could be used in field to just capture everyday life. It was an art and it required a lot of attention and careful detail. You know, just like it says on this website, you know, the technique of combination printing was painstaking. It wasn't something that could just be done. When it comes to research, I'm someone who wants all the information presented so I can make a balanced and fair assessment for myself. While I cannot vouch for the accuracy of Metropolitan Museum's article on Legray, I do believe ignoring this type of information in favor of presenting one's desired narrative is a prime example of cherry picking. Legray keeping his techniques to himself while fleeing France and abandoning his family deserves equal, if not more, merit than a vast conspiracy regarding photography development. So I was, I'm was i a bit confused in, in some ways because he does jump to these hasty generalizations and conclusions, 
which don't really match with the information he was presenting. But also as well is that I don't know whether because he stopped using the word Tartaria. And I don't know whether this is in support of that hypothesis or not. But what he's presented actually delivers like a tremendous blow to the Tartarian hypothesis. Whether it's a verbal debate, you know, an essay or an entire book, an argument is very similar to a chess game. And just like in chess, when you make an argument, you have to anticipate and try and foresee all your opponents and opposition's moves in advance. And it's the same in argument. When you're, when you're making an argument or you're in a debate, you're always trying to see the potential pitfalls of that argument. Initially, that should be done from an honest perspective because you want the argument to be correct. But once you feel like you have a correct argument, you still have to see those pitfalls because you will be challenged. When, when I talk about the weak spots in an argument, I mean like the holes, the contradictory statements, the weak areas without enough evidence, moments of hypocrisy, tautology, fallacy. When you suppress evidence and present different kinds of evidence in, in support of your argument, selectivity, bias, you know, these are your weak areas uh, in argument. And this is why I really like Mind Unveil's latest video, because it draws to the surface the Tartaria hypothesis's biggest weakness. And it kind of corners it into a lose-lose situation. And that's the photo manipulation. A big part of the hypothesis relies on the viewer or the recipient believing that all construction photographs are fake. But what Mind Unveiled presents in this video is that Photo manipulation occurred across all kinds of photographs. And what he shows is that they could remove people from photographs, you know, remove them entirely. They could remove objects. He calls it vanilla sky. It's not vanilla sky is the oversensitizing dyes and the whitewashing due to the light, but the cropping of the sky and the cropping of certain buildings as well. He also shows instances where there's been artistic liberties. So, you know, the producer of the photograph is etched onto the onto the image and drawn things in there but 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 as part of its conclusion basically and this is a direct quotation all old world photos are fake basically all old world photos are fake and that's an extreme mindset because there's no evidence for that there's evidence that there was manipulation in the same way there is today one of his primary sources for the manipulated images is a Detroit publishing company. But the Detroit publishing company was a postcard company. And postcards by default are manipulated. And you see that here, especially with colorized photochrome. You see the way the edges are faded. You see that they emphasize good weather. And you see that they also remove objects that damage the composition of the photograph. So it's exactly the same as it is today with magazines, adverts, and you know, whatnot. And we make people look more beautiful today, just as they did back then. You know, he states that uh, photo manipulation has been around since the camera's inception. Well, that immediately tells us that one, the Victorians were indeed advanced and not just horse and cart people. But most importantly, that two, the practice of image manipulation was exactly the same back then as it is today, just not as good. But that doesn't mean that all photographs are fake. So I can go to a, con a construction site, take a photograph, come home, put it into the computer, crop out the sky, change the colors, increase the contrast, turn it to black and white. And that's a manipulated photo. But the construction site was still real. It still existed. So his conclusions are off, but it's problematic for the Tartarian hypothesis because he's showing that they could remove people. Now, a big part of the Tartarian hypothesis relies on the notion that the cities in the 19th century, a lot of them were empty. Where are all the people? Now, me and you have explained that it's long exposure time. But Mind Unveil kind of rejects that exposure, long exposure time in there and says that that could be manipulated as well. And that's fine. Then why is it not possible that they just removed all the people from these images, these cityscapes, to make it a better image? And it's the same with the instances of cropping and copying and pasting. He shows a building being what he considers cropped and copied and pasted into the, into the shot. And I think he says, 
We can also see the same thing in this V3 version, where the building with the white bandaid now has similar scratchings to the middle building from V2, as if they were trying to take it out to use for other photos. Notice that ornamental border on the top? So is this an added building? It's a copy and paste building. But then in the Sartorian hypothesis, this makes it very problematic because you have cityscapes, San Francisco, for example, or Melbourne, shots of Melbourne and Sydney and Australia. And people think, whoa, these are really built up for the 19th century. You know, if we take Mind and Val's logic and reasoning here, then how did the advocates know that they didn't manipulate these photos to make the city seem larger and more populated through copy and pasting? You know, we don't subscribe to this idea, but you can't cherry pick with this one. If all old world photos are fake, then this also needs to be considered as fake. And then you might say, well, why would they want to fake images of what the city looked like? But Mind and Val kind of answers that without actually addressing it, is that if they were to fake photographs, of cities and make them look a lot bigger and a lot more glorious than they were, especially in America and Australia, it would be propaganda and advertisements that draw in migration. In terms of the world's fairs, I feel like it also now throws all of the information that's been presented there because those buildings don't exist for the most part anymore. There are some that are still standing today, but in the history books, they were built later after the World's Fairs. Case in point with the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. It's on the record as being built, the permanent one you see today in the 1960s, construction and in, in the 1970s. There's one in Chicago. I think it became known as the Field Museum. And that construction started in the 1930s. So all those old glorious photos that we've seen of the World's Fairs, those are now out the window because you've admitted that all photographs are fake. That includes those. So the Tartaria hypothesis just lost the World's Fairs too. Yeah, and with the World's Fairs as well, when you look at them, they look amazing in those old photographs. But if they were that good at touching up images, and he shows that, he shows how people were made to look more beautiful than they were. Well, then why wouldn't you do that with, with a fair? Of course you would. And you also get photographs of the fairs illuminated at night, and you think, whoa, they had all this amazing light systems and electricity. Again, the photo manipulation has to be applied there. It has to be applied to everything. So what me and you would do, and we said this, we said this in our photography video, is that every single photograph needs to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And it has to be evidence that there's traces of photo manipulation. And you could say, you could say, well, maybe they were that good that you can't even tell. And that's fine. But then you invalidate your entire argument and you invalidate your entire lens into the past because then suddenly every single image is suspect. The cities of the past, the way they look, they don't look that way today. San Francisco does not look like it did in the 19th century. And it's the same with Sydney and Australia. It's the same all over the world. So if you're going to make a case that all historical images, photographs are fake or have the potential to be fabricated, you invalidate all your lens into the past. You no longer have an argument. Empty cities is gone. World's fairs is gone. So what me and you do, we try and take each photograph on a case-by-case -case basis. And there are crop-ins, and there are composite images, and there are images that have been used for propaganda, and postcards that have had the sky blue because it's, it's tourist propaganda. You're saying, come here. But you can't cherry pick and use postcards as evidence that all construction photographs are fake. You have to see it for what it is. Sky changes, retouching, cropping, removing people are not evidence that we didn't build these structures. No, but it is evidence that they could make their photos look better and locations look a lot more enticing and welcoming. So now you have no solid foundation to argue that the cities of the past were even glorious. They may not have looked this good or been so built up. So what Meinemwald has done is brilliant because he says, And we should certainly be questioning any photos on the historical record and the level of retouching that has been done to these. 
But then what happens is it leads him to this mindset of basically all old world photos are fake. That also includes all the buildings that do not stand today, like the Singer building. Now you don't have that one anymore, because even though there are construction photos of it, even though there are photos of it existing, it doesn't stand today. We don't have evidence of it. The only evidence you had of it was in photographs, and it was classified as a Tartarian building. According to this new presentation and research, that building no longer exists anymore. You don't have an argument that the Singer building was Tartarian. Yeah, unless you can prove that every single construction photograph is has been manipulated, you can't use it as an argument because you lose everything. The photos that Stuff Beags and Mind Unveiled have shared are obviously manipulated or altered. Anyone can see that just by looking at them. Now, they do find cases where they're in archives and they're not mentioned that they are manipulated. And I wouldn't immediately go and say, well, that means that there's a mass conspiracy taking place here and all photos are faked and manipulated. But from the photos that we presented on construction sites, whether it be the canal photos, it's very possible there may have been retouching somewhere along the way for restoration purposes. But for the most part, there is no evidence of it. They are basic photos taken with the basic cameras for the time period. To conclude, every photograph we've shared is doctored because photo manipulation is possible is equivalent to coming to the conclusion every vocal musician uses auto-tune because auto-tune exists. Yep, I agree. It's worth outlining too that documentary photography is different from architecture photography, which would have been taken by firms to demo their work and from photographs that have been formatted for postcards, magazines, newspapers, I mean, it's quite obvious that with images where the sky has been cropped or certain obstructions like buildings have been cropped, they were going to be processed for a different format. Just like the Singer building here, the photo on the left is the original and it's been processed into this postcard on the right. And it's got a different sky and whatnot. And we still practice this form of photo manipulation today for publication. And there is also such a thing as art. Many artists today still merge painting and photography. We practice all of this more today than we ever have done. And it would be very easy for a generation in a hundred years time to find all of this and use it to hypothesize that we didn't exist, you know, and we're a historical fabrication. But that's not the case. Not everything is a lie and not everything is truth. And there's a reason that I never use photo manipulation to support my arguments in LHFE. Because it's cherry picking. And cherry picking is hypocrisy. My novel concludes We must use other methods to question the official narrative outside of photographs that were given to the libraries and archive collections through these corporate publishing companies. And we actually agree. It is time for the Tartarian advocates to use methods outside of photography to question the narrative. You can't make photo manipulation your central argument because, like we've said, it undoes all of your arguments. You don't have a lens into the past. You need to go to different methods of debunking history and especially construction. So there's a vast amount of available evidence that can be tested to demonstrate whether manual construction is possible or not. Steam machines still exist. You can go and test them out. You can build a Jim Pole crane or a Derek crane out of wood and see if it can lift a load. And we do have evidence of people moving megalithic heavy stone manually. We, we have evidence we can carve stone. There's so much evidence out there that we can make bricks on mass. So that, that's where it needs to be debunked. You need to actually demonstrate that we can't do this stuff manually. And then you might have an argument. What I think he's done, he's put the Tartarian advocates into a very tricky position. You know, they try to use his examples of photo manipulation as supporting evidence that all construction photographs are fake. Then, like we discussed, they lose major components to their hypothesis because you can't arbitrarily just cherry pick to suit your argument. And just to go back to when you showed Legray, I noticed it said down the bottom that he was buddies with Alexandre Dumas. He wrote a famous novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. Well, that's another area the advocates can attempt to debunk. Debunk all the writers, because they wrote both fiction and social commentary. The world is captured very well in their texts. 
So as a starting point, that would be Dickens, the Brontes, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Victor Hugo, William Faulkner, Herman Melville. And then there is the archival newspaper documents in the millions, the documentation on construction. It's interesting that Mind Unveiled uses an old book on photo manipulation to support his argument. Why would a book like that be any more historically valid than this document outlining construction practices? So that's another area to turn to. So this is the Royal Fork. And this applies to argument. The Royal Fork is when the opponent's king is checked while their queen is also simultaneously marked. And the opponent is forced to move their king because they're checked. But in doing so, they forfeit their queen. And this is what Mind and Val has just done to the Tartarian hypothesis with this photo manipulation video. It's a lose-lose situation. Because by using photo manipulation to support an argument that all construction photographs are fake, you invalidate all historical photographs and lose all central components that make up your hypothesis. You lose everything. So this is what he's done. He's put you into this. You know, the king is the hypothesis and the queen is photo manipulation. And they both can't exist here. So if you're going to move that over to keep the hypothesis going, then photo manipulation has to go. It just doesn't work. On the topic of photo manipulation, Mind Unveiled shouts out Autodidactic's video on overexposure. Now, we recently just did a video explaining star forts to Autodidactic and crew, and we use this one as an example. Now, I have not manipulated this photo. This is a screenshot. Anyone can go to the video and they can see this for themselves. In the video, they have this star fort titled Nowhere Kazakhstan. But right above it, you can actually see there is a pin with the name of the fort. Now, Campbell went on the record and said that this was not mapped. Do they call it a star fort or, they, or is it just an anomaly to them? No, it's not even, uh, it's not even mapped. That was just something that... That this is not in the history books. Yeah, they just happened to find it. Like It's not in any books. There'd be no story of a complete anomaly. But yet in their video, you can see that there has been manipulation and the blue tag and the name of the fort wants to be here. This one is actually an even better example because now you can even see the word fort is showing up here. So I'm just curious, since you guys are such experts at photo manipulation, because this is coming directly from Campbell's video where they said there's no record of this. But yet I can see the name of the fort right here. So we were asked to explain star forts. Now I'm asking someone from this crew to explain to me who manipulated the photo. So yeah, thanks again, Mine and Val, for that video. Um, it saved us a lot of time. And we recommend you go check it out and let him know that we sent you. Nowhere can be found. Yeah, it does.